Mm, thank you very much. Bless you. Well, we have already pre-recorded the interview with you and Murray, done by Vinnie Commons, who, of course, works with us and was speaking last week. Um, uh, Ewan at the moment is in Arizona, but let's go over to the recording. A very good evening to you all. And this is Vinnie Commons on Zoom from Lancashire. And tonight it is a privilege and a pleasure to welcome a man in the USA, in the state of Kentucky. His name is Ewan Murray. Ewan, welcome. Thank you, Vinnie. Thank you. Nice to speak to you all the way from Kentucky. Good. And what time is it in Kentucky at the moment? Uh, it's about uh, half past one in the afternoon. Okay. Well, the questions won't be just as hard as that, Ewan, so you'll okay, be okay. Thanks, <laughs> now, Ewan, uh, you're on here because uh, you have a Christian faith, but you're one of the few people who have represented your country and the British Lions at Rugby Union. Is this correct? Um, yeah, there, there's, a, there's a number of us, but yeah, that's correct. I played rugby for Scotland over, I think, uh, I don't know, got my first cap in 2005, last one in 2015, so 10 years. And then I, I did go out in the 2009 British Lions tour to South Africa. But and then again, how, how many caps did you eventually, uh, get for your country yeah i got 66, 66 caps for scotland now for people who are not into rugby um can you tell us the position you played and can you tell us what your job then was at that position on the pitch uh, my position was tight head prop so i'm at the front of the scrum uh right in right in the heat of things um my role was uh kind of a linchpin position it's called the cornerstone of the scrum um and yeah i mean i would come off the pitch about an inch shorter with all the compression that was going on and um yeah just a supportive role and you know trying to dish it out rather than taking the brunt of things because it's better to give than to receive <laughs> yeah, enjoyed my position Okay. Now, you and you obviously got to a very high standard in your sporting um, interest. But tell us, how was it that you chose rugby as opposed to any other sport growing up? Well, I was, you know, I was always interested in animals um, and I became a vet. Uh, so it was kind of the natural, <laughs> natural sport to get into. Uh, you know, 15 animals and my team and 15 on the other so that was it so you like the dog eat dog bit oh yeah and uh, a lot of people have role models to encourage them along life's journey in sport who would be your role models and if you like significant others again growing up as a youngster um well my you know my father and my grandfather were role models for me um my dad played rugby um, when he was young and he was kind of my first coach. He taught me how to tackle. Uh, he never actually coached me in a team, mm. but, you know, he was a big role model in my life um, and still is. And, uh, and then people like Sean Fitzpatrick, who played for New Zealand, New Zealand All Blacks. Um, he was a captain. Uh, Gavin Hastings. Uh, he was an inspirational leader on the field for Scotland. Hmm. Uh, so players like that stuck out. And when you stood there representing your country and they played the national anthem at Murrayfield, you and what what goes through your mind often, and uh, what were you thinking about? Um, you know, I'm I'm thinking about my family. Um, thinking about singing in tune when the camera goes past me. Uh, trying to keep it together and not, not shed too many tears and um, just concentrating on, you know, what, what I'm doing it for. And uh, speaking to Princess Anne, for example, do you remember what you said to her? Um, yeah, but I don't think she understood me because of my accent. So. <laughs> okay. Now, Ewan, um, you 
not only played nationally and for the Lions, but you also played for several clubs. And I think I came across you when you played at Northampton. But I think it was Glasgow you sort of kicked off in. What was the sort of professional teams that you played for week in, week out? Um, so, yeah, I played, I started at Glasgow um, and then I went down to Northampton indeed. Um, and it was there that my Scotland career flourished and uh, I got into the Lions. Uh, then I went up to Newcastle and then uh, I spent a short time in France, back over to Worcester um, and then back up to Glasgow and then off to France again for my uh, for my last season. OK, and you said there that you trained as a vet. I think you did about one week's work and turned professional at rugby. But at the moment, you're living in the USA and working as a vet. That's correct. Yeah. But so it was... Day? Pardon? What does your day-to-day -day timetable look like? Uh, so when I first came to the US, I was doing an internship in large animal medicine and surgery. And that was at seven days a week, um, you know, 70 hour a week. And then I did a small animal internship. That was about 60 plus hours a week. Um, and then I've just finished uh, an internship in ophthalmology. Uh, so now I've started working as an ER vet and that's 12 hour shifts, which can be pretty stressful. And what does that actually mean? Uh, so I'm an emergency veterinarian and I work in a, an emergency clinic. So, you know, we have triages coming in all the time. Uh, dogs hit by cars, um, dogs that are vomiting, cats that are collapsed, um, unable to walk, things like that. All right. And you're happily married to Sarah and you've got several children. Tell us about them. Yeah, uh, Sarah, she's, she's my wife. She's American. Um, we met 10 years ago, uh, it'll be our anniversary soon, and we have five children now, so five half Scottish, half American kids. Okay. Now, Ewan, um, you had a, quite a, a wild life before you became a Christian. Tell us what you were like and tell us what were the events leading up to you becoming a real Christian? Yeah, sure. So... You know, I was brought up in a in a family that was uh, semi Christian. So my mum would take us to church, um, but my dad is not a Christian. Um, but my grandparents had a big impact on on our lives and brought us up to believe that the Bible is the word of God, um, and to respect and honour God's name. Mm. Um, so growing up, I had a, you know a an idea of the Bible. And I thought I was a Christian, but I remember when I was 16 and I met somebody at a different church and uh, that person said, you know, asked me when I got saved. And I thought, saved? <laughs> well, I don't need to get saved. You know what, like as if I, as if I need help from somebody. Yeah. Um, so age 18, I was still going to church, thought I was a Christian. Uh, but I got involved with a, an older uh, woman um, and soon found that we were, you know, we, we started sleeping together, which the Bible says is wrong. But I compromised. I was making excuses and saying, oh, it'll be OK, we'll get married. Mm. Um, and, you know, the Bible's clear that any sexual activity outside of one man and one woman in one marriage um, is wrong um, in the eyes of God. Um, so I was compromising. Uh, that relationship didn't go anywhere. Um, and then, you know, I became a professional rugby player. So by the age of 25, um, I just played for my country. I, you know, I, I had money and, uh, women and success, and my, my uh, dream fulfilled to become a vet. So I had everything that I ever dreamed of mm. and I, I didn't feel happy. And there were guys around me who were going out 
you know, drinking and stuff. And and my conscience always bothered me. Mm-hmm. And at at one point, I made the, you know, stupid decision to try to get rid of my conscience and just to do whatever I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, whatever I felt like um, and was tempted to do. So I rejected God and uh, the teachings of the Bible. Okay. Really. Now, you and um, when you were playing rugby and things, yeah. a lot of people think that rugby players can be quite vicious. Is that the case? And secondly, what I'd like to know is when you come off after a big match and let's say you've had a pound in or you've had a success, what's it like in the dressing room? So, you know, guys can be vicious, yeah, on the field. Um, and it's just the nature of the sport, you know, to uh, to try and run as hard as you can, tackle as hard as you can, hit as hard as you can. Um, but when you get into the dressing room, you know, it's just the guys were just having fun and, uh, yeah, just enjoying each other's company. But when you, let's say you played for Scotland and you've nearly won or you, you, you've been pounded or else you've won, uh, tell us what goes, you know, what does the coach say after the game? What type of things do people discuss or is it just silence? Uh, so, you know, after, if, if we lose, then, you know, there's a few minutes where people are just getting, taking their boots off and stuff. And um, it's pretty downheartening. Uh, the coach will give a little talk about things we, where we knew we could have done better, or reasons we might have lost the game or, you know, things that were encouraging um and just to get back on the horse uh, that kind of thing when when we won you know it was uh you know everyone's elated so um you know everyone's celebrating and having fun and there's yeah it's completely different you know when when you lose the, the feelings completely different um you and there's a lot of uh links between the drinking culture and rugby I'm not saying every rugby player therefore drinks alcohol and gets sort of um, plastered with it. But all I'm saying is it's linked. So how did you find that when you were growing up? Were you just one of the boys doing that or what was it like? So I didn't really, I didn't drink alcohol, um, you know, getting drunk probably until my early 20s you know nine maybe 1920 um because i was serious about getting into rugby getting far in rugby and doing well in my vet degree like to try and get into vet school so you know i, I tried to uh, be sensible and look after my body um but yeah sure you know, as I got older, I got into the drinking. There can be a lot of drinking, um, especially at the lower levels. And, um, yeah, I mean, we had a lot of fun. You know, I had a lot of fun growing up in my teams. And, yes, there would be quite a bit of drinking at times. Okay. Now, you and there was a particular game. I think you were playing an Irish team and you got a major injury. I think it was through not only just affect your body, but it was to affect you spiritually. And uh, tell us what happened and tell us what went through your mind when you were left alone in the hospital thinking about things. Yeah, sure. So um, it's 2005. Uh, it was the beginning of the season. I was playing for Glasgow against Munster. And um, just to set the scene, uh, you know, if you had opened my wallet that night, there would have been you know, free passes to the strip club. Um, and, you know, we were, I was just all about uh, having fun and living the high life. But, you know, I was at that stage where I had everything mm. and I didn't feel satisfied. And uh, that night, um, right before the game, 
I said the Lord's Prayer, asking for forgiveness. But really, I was just being a hypocrite because I knew that I was just doing it, you know, in case I, you know, had a bad injury or in case I died or something. Yeah. Um, and and then I had to, you know, I wanted to kind of make peace before that happened because yeah. um, I was scared of dying yeah. uh, deep down. But, you know, I was running, as I said before, I was running from my conscience and trying to destroy it. Um, but it always bothered me. And I wanted to, yeah, I, did, I didn't want to change. But that night I thought, I'm just a complete hypocrite, you know, saying these prayers. And I'd had a lot of injuries. And every time I had an injury, I would think maybe God's involved in this. And my conscience would again accuse me, you know, mm. and say, you're not, you know, you know, you're not doing the right thing. Mm. Um, and yeah, I thought I'm a hypocrite and I thought, you know, what if these injuries are related to God? So I made this subconscious decision that, you know, if one more, if I get one more bad injury, I'm going to turn back to God. Um, well, five minutes later, I was out in the field. I went to tackle somebody, um, a player called Anthony Horgan. Uh, hit his knee uh, you know I tackle guys all the time but his knee hit me in the temple and I get knocked out cold and started having a seizure in the field um, and my teammates afterwards said that they thought I was dying so you can imagine you know when I woke up going out to the ambulance and then when my brain comes back online uh, when I'm in the hospital I realised that you know I had just said if I get one more bad thing, then I'm going to turn back to God. Well, you know, when the lights went out and uh, after people had visited that night, um, I lay in bed scared um, because I realized that, I realized what had just happened and I believed that, that God had allowed it to happen. And he gave me a fright because I believed that, you know, he had let me be hit so hard that mm. I sat up and took notice, but not hard enough that, you know, that was it. No more chances. And I, I knew I had a chance. So I tried to change um, from that night on. But... I found that the harder I tried to fight against temptation, mm. uh, the more I was giving in. And I felt like I had a, you know, a choke chain that a dog has, uh, where the more the dog struggles, the tighter the, the choke chain gets. Mm. And I felt like that was the, the sin and the power of it in my life. And I couldn't, you know, every time I tried to resist uh, temptations, sexual temptations and, um, you know, temptations to get drunk, um, mm. things like that. Uh, I, when I was pushed enough, I had no power. Um, now, Ewan, when you found that um, um, the way of the Lord Jesus is not so much by effort, in other words, like you've just described, when you found that it was a gift, the gift of God is life eternal, how did that make you feel? Because that's totally contrary to what you're trying to do at the moment. It's free. It's a gift. Who told you that message and how did it make you feel? So uh, I'd been going to churches and, you know, there were good churches, some of them. Um, uh, but I wasn't hearing the message that could change my life. And I went into a wee church in Govan, a uh, wee Baptist church, and the it was a visiting preacher and he said that you know he basically described my life and how i tried everything and i wasn't satisfied and yeah. there was something that could change it and he said that you need to believe that jesus christ is the son of god and he came to earth to die for your sins 
And when I heard that, I thought, you know, I've heard that before, but that's not changing my life because I, I don't have this power to repent. Mm. And he's, the man said, you need to believe that with all your heart and mm. ask Jesus into your heart to be the Lord of your life. And I realized then that I'd never done that and that if I were to do that, then he would know everything about me mm. and all my secrets and all the things I'm ashamed of. Um, and he would be in charge of everything and I would potentially lose everything, mm. including popularity, which was, you know, my biggest idol. Um, possibly my job, possibly everything. Uh, but I, I did trust that Jesus was good and I trusted that he did die on the cross. I just didn't know if it was for me. And so I begged Jesus to, to make me born again, even though I didn't understand the term and to come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. And after a few weeks, it, I realized that it had been ages since I'd given in to certain temptations. Mm. And I realized that it was Jesus Christ who had given me the power to do that. Mm. And therefore, when I looked, when I thought in my mind's, you know, my mind's eye about Jesus dying on the cross, yeah, I realized that all of my sin, all of my filth had been placed on him. Mm. And, and so therefore that left me completely clean. And so that was the, the happiest moment of my, of my life. And what age were you? I was 26. And so I was telling everyone that, you know, I, I, I was telling everyone, you know, <laughs> to tell people about this. Uh, well, you're like, beginning to play the game and tell them. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, no. Nah. But, you know, after games and stuff, because this was just such a revelation to me, and I believe and still believe with all my heart that it's completely true. Mm. And, and so I know, looking back at I saw... I know that God took me through all of that. And it was, it was he who allowed me to go to the worst of the worst, mm. the worst of the worst. <laughs> and it, it was God who drew me to Jesus. And it was Jesus who who transformed my life. Okay. And, and it was God who opened my eyes to, you know, amazing things in the Bible and gave me a, a you know, such a, a, a desire to be with him and walk with him in life's path. Now, you and when you'd become a Christian, you were still obviously playing rugby. Did you get any sort of, as the boys call it, stick for being a Christian? Did they tease you, wind you up, mock you? What happened? Yeah, there was there was a bit of that. You know, most of it was just friendly banter. Um, you know, there was, I think, you know, most guys would have respected my decisions. But, um, you know, if somebody's in the in the team's a bit different, then everyone's going to jab fun at them. It's just the nature of it. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, if somebody has something on their conscience and, you know, they stand up for that, then generally people respect it. That isn't always the case. Um, you know, and some of the decisions are made, you know, and, you know, especially about not playing on a Sunday, um, I did get a lot of stick about mm. that at times. Um, so that, you know, that was hard. But well, even though you as a Christian felt that it wasn't right to play 
your sport on Sunday and being church, uh, you were still picked for the team the other six days of the week, Ewan. How did that come about? Yeah, well, when I made the decision, and again, it was just a, it was a matter of conscience and uh, studying uh, the word of God and prayer. That, uh, yeah, I mean, I just tried to work as hard as I could as a rugby player. And I said to the professional teams, hey, you can employ me. Uh, I'm happy to take less money, you know, but I'm, I don't want to play on a Sunday anymore. Mm. Uh, so you can, you can take it or leave it. You don't need to choose me. You don't need to pay me. Um, you don't need to give me a job. You know, because well, looked after you there, didn't they? You were a bit like Eric Little, the 1924 athlete from Scotland. <laughs> well, he was, he was a lot faster. <laughs> um, uh, you and uh, let's just move on a little bit. Um, you're now living in the USA, and you've got a nice little church, no doubt, out there. But um, tell us about your um, your daughters and what's your plans for the future. Uh, so yeah, I have four daughters. Uh, and one son, so poor wee Lachlan, um, he's all alone. <laughs> My plans for the future uh, are to look after the kids with um, my wife and the help and protection of God, um, to uh, bring them up in a way which pleases him. Um, really, I, I think... It would be good to get them closer to their grandparents who are over in, okay. in east coast east coast of America, uh, yeah. and then to do some. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, you know, I am a vet, uh, so I'm gonna try. I'm, I'm undecided to be honest. I'm thinking of doing some coaching, yeah. um, and or. Uh, going just full time vet, so I, I do. Um, I am. Sorry, I was going to say. Do you think that you might try and make it back over to the UK? Uh, just for holidays. All right. Yeah. And have you any take on the national squad at the moment? How are the Scots doing? Ah, uh, well, with the lockdown stuff, you know, everyone's been, nobody's been doing anything. So, the league in England has just started up. Uh, so. It's, it's been an interesting time, but Scotland's got some great players and lots of potential, but it's just a, a small player base compared to some of the other teams. So it's who, who would you say is the best player you've ever played against? And who would you say is um, uh, in your own team the best player you've played with? So it's the player that you've played against and the teammate that you played with? Yeah, that's a difficult question. There are a lot of, a lot of good players. Um, probably the best player I've played against would have been Richie McCaw, uh, all black captain. And I think he's probably the most capped all black. Mm. Uh, best player I've played with? Um, Probably Tom Smith. Uh, he was he was an excellent player and an inspiration. Um, and where was uh, that at? So I played with him at Northampton. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, he he is he's struggling with cancer at the moment. So just uh, remember him in your prayers. Okay. Well, Ewan, that's been a fascinating story. What would you say to somebody who perhaps, I don't know, has got a lot going for them like you have um, and you had, but we're all threatened with the problem with COVID and all the implications. So what advice or what would you say to somebody who perhaps is searching for the God's love and God's forgiveness? Where would you tell them to look and what advice would you give them? Um, well... I would say that you know all the all the pleasures of this world uh, are, as somebody once said, like 
just bubbles. Um, you know, they're perfectly spherical and all the colors of the rainbow, light as a feather. But every time you, you get one in your hand, it pops and it's empty. Mm -hmm. And so while the things of this world are, are beautiful and attractive and, and great fun to chase, ultimately they're empty and we'll only find like our true fulfillment in life if we know Jesus Christ and if he knows us mm. and the only way to get to know him is to read about him in the Bible and to pray to him mm. and ask him to reveal himself to you and find a good church uh, that preaches the the truth, which is the whole Bible, mm. not with certain things taken out. Okay. And so and he, <laughs> you know, he um, he is the only one who can truly help us, and he's the one that loves us so much that he laid his own life down for us. There we go. Ewan, to whom can we go? You alone of the words of eternal life. Thank you very much for your uh, interview and uh, regards to Sarah and the girls. And Thanks, Vinny. Thank you. Thanks, Vinny. God bless you too. Great. Thank you very much both to Vinny for interviewing and for Ewan Murray. Now, Ewan should be joining you, but first of all, we've got Mike Lotz. I think he's a bit of a sniveling creep. Honestly, he's got to want a Scottish <laughs> rugby, <laughs> rugby top. Anyway, Michael, it's great to have you. We'd love you to share something from the word of God for us. Well, uh, thanks so much, Roger. Great um, to be with you. Yes, I was tempted to wear my uh, to wear my England shirt tonight. Um, yes, you should have done. I am. Um, <laughs> I thought as Ewan was here, I'd wear my shirt. You might be wondering why, as I am a complete Englishman, uh, I'm wearing a Scottish shirt. It's actually because I'm married to a Scot. So uh, when we started dating uh, a couple of years ago, um, we had to come up to an arrangement. What was going to happen? So I said, well, when Scotland are playing, I will support Scotland. When England are playing, my wife supports England. Um, but of course, the quick question is what happens when we play each other and we just have a fight. But but the reality is actually just after we started dating, um, Scotland were playing England in the Calcutta Cup. And I was thinking this could be quite serious, you know, depending on who wins. Anyway, it was a draw, which is probably the most diplomatic thing that could have happened on that particular occasion. Uh, but wasn't that great hearing that story uh, from you and this evening and uh, hearing how um, God had worked in his life? But actually tonight, I want to ask you, ask all of us a question, and it's this. What would it take for us to take God seriously? What would it take for us to take God seriously? We've heard a bit tonight from you, and haven't we, in terms of what it took for him to seriously start thinking about God and about life and about how life and how God fit together. But what would it take for you, what would it take for me? Well, maybe it would take everything to go wrong. And we've heard tonight, haven't we, and you and story about how he got seriously injured. And it was actually that injury that caused him to think seriously about God, to be thinking seriously about his life and where his life was headed. And sometimes things like that happen to us in life, don't they? A relationship comes to an end. A job suddenly uh, we're made redundant from. Uh, news from a doctor that is serious, a reminder of our mortality or the fragility of life. Things go wrong and they make us ask big questions. What is life about? Where is it heading? Is there a God? Is he interested in me? And actually, I guess for many of us in the last year, COVID has caused us to ask some of those big questions. It's reminded us of our mortality, but it's also reminded us of life's fragility. So maybe it would take everything to go wrong, but actually maybe quite the opposite. What would it take to get us to think about God seriously? Maybe it would take everything to go right. Maybe it would take us to achieve our dreams and our, our ambitions, to actually start to think seriously. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, sometimes it's only when we realise our dreams that we realise that our dreams are not big enough. 
Sometimes it's only when we achieve our life's ambitions that we realize that there must be something more. Ewan shared that tonight, didn't he? He said how he'd achieved great success, and he has. I mean, think about the success that he's achieved on the rugby pitch. It's pretty much up there, isn't it? He says, I had it all, and yet there was something missing. And sometimes it's when you get everything you've ever dreamed of that you realize that there's that nigg niggling sense that there must be something more. Now, I've never played international rugby, but I do enjoy watching it. And for me, my greatest sporting moment has therefore come watching England win the Rugby World Cup on television. I remember way back 2003, um, it was such an exciting moment when finally Johnny Wilkinson dropped the goal for World Cup glory in extra time. And, um, and I remember standing on the, the settee, jumping up and down, embracing my friends. It was fantastic. But if you can remember, it was in Australia. So as I was in the UK watching it in the morning, the whole game was over by about 10.30, wasn't it? Anyway, this has been such an elating moment of winning the World Cup. But I remember later on that day, about lunchtime, walking through town, thinking to myself, we've just won the World Cup. And now what do I do? <laughs> I've just achieved, or we have, you know, as a, as a nation, this great dream. I had very little to do with it, I have to, to say. But, but what next? What now? Sometimes you can achieve your dreams and realize that actually there's that niggling sense that something's missing. If you want to change sport, think of Chris Boardman. He was the first Olympic athlete for Great Britain, uh, first gold medalist in cycling uh, for Great Britain in 72 years. But Chris Boardman said this, he says, your entire life is wrapped up in getting this one thing. You believe this one thing is the answer. And once you get that thing, you'll tell yourself you'll be satisfied. But listen to what he says next. He says, the lucky ones get that thing and then find it's not the answer. And then they can start to look for the right place for satisfaction and happiness because it's not wrapped up in a gold medal. See, what would it take us to think seriously about God? Maybe it would take everything to go wrong, but maybe it takes everything to go right for us to realize our dreams. And we still realize there must be something more. Well, I want us to think just for a few moments uh, before we go to that time of questions, for a few moments about that story we had read to us by Hannah earlier from Mark's account of Jesus' life. It was a story of this man who comes to Jesus. He's obviously urgent to come to Jesus because he's running to him. He's keen to encounter Jesus. But you might ask, why did he want to come and speak to Jesus? What was his motivation? What was it that had got him thinking seriously about God and about life? Or maybe it was because everything had gone wrong. Maybe, we don't know, something had happened to him. Maybe he'd received diagnosis from a doctor. Maybe something had shattered his worldview and it had made him think seriously. But I actually wonder whether it would be the opposite. Because the Bible tells us that this man was incredibly successful. He was, he was young, he was rich, uh, he was a local leader, he had authority. We sometimes call him the rich young ruler for those reasons, because of the biblical accounts and what they tell us about him. But here's a man who's got it all. I mean, riches, wealth and power all at the same time. I mean, lots of people have youth, but they don't have wealth. And then they've spent their youth achieving their wealth and then they don't have the youth to enjoy it. But here is a man who's got youth and wealth at the same time. He's got everything you might think would make you happy. And yet, perhaps he's realised that there's still something missing, that there must be something more. And he comes to Jesus. I wonder, have you ever realised that? That there must be something more and it's caused you. Maybe that's why you're watching tonight because you realize there must be something more to life than you think. Could it be found in this man, Jesus? Well, what does he do when he comes to Jesus and he asks him this question? He says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, again, you might wonder why would a good, a young man be interested in eternal life? I mean, surely that's what old people are interested in when they know that they might die. But this man, as far as we know, has got a lot of living to do before he's gonna start dying. Why is he interested in eternal life? Well, again, we don't know, but let me suggest a couple of reasons. Firstly, it doesn't matter how old or young you are. When you start to realize that life has an ending, and if you think that that is the ending of everything, it makes life feel rather depressing, doesn't it? 
I mean, think of it. If all of life's achievements, if everything you've ever done and achieved is ultimately going to count for nothing, if life is going to be snubbed out with death and there is nothing beyond, what is the point? What's the point of continuing? What's the point of everything we do? It doesn't matter how old or young you are. That's an important question to ask. But maybe there's another reason why he was asking about eternal life, and it's this. You see, when we think of eternal life, we just think about what happens beyond death. But actually, according to Jesus, eternal life is not just what happens after you die. It's also something that can happen before you die. See, in one of the other accounts of Jesus' life, Jesus defines to us, explains to us what eternal life is. He says eternal life is knowing God and knowing Jesus Christ, his son. Now, the word know there isn't some kind of intellectual knowledge like you get when you revise for an exam. It literally means to know, to, to have a relationship. It's intimate and personal. Jesus says eternal life is a relationship with the God of the universe. It's being connected with the God who made you. See, eternal life is not just life after death. It's also about life before death. It's not just about a quantity of life. It's about a quality of life. And Jesus Christ offers that to us. And he says you can have everything in the world, but unless you have that, there'll always be something missing because that is what we're made for. We were made to be connected to God and Jesus is the one who can do it. Well, the story continues. He's asked Jesus what he must do to get eternal life. And Jesus says something rather surprising, doesn't he? Did you notice as Hannah read it earlier? Jesus responds to him and says, why do you call me good? And then he says, no one is good except God alone. Now, why does Jesus respond to this man in that way? Well, remember the question that he's just asked. He's just said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what's the assumption that lies behind that question? Well, surely it's this. There is something I need to do to get eternal life. In other words, if there is a God, if there is a heaven, if there is a way to be connected to God, I have to earn it. I have to do something. I have to be religious. I have to go to church. I have to help old ladies across the road. You fill in the blanks. There is something I have to do. We earn our way to God. That's the assumption, isn't it, of pretty much everyone in the world by default. And what does Jesus do? He says, no one is good except God alone. What does he mean by that? He says, okay, if you think you can be good enough to get to heaven, if you think you can be good enough to get to God, I'll tell you what good enough is. It's God. He's the only one that is good enough. And by the way, your application to join the Godhead has just been turned down. In other words, you're not good enough. None of us are. Now, this man doesn't quite get it because Jesus continues, doesn't he? He lists a number of the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal and so on. And this man responds to Jesus and he says, well, I've kept all of those since I was a boy. But then Jesus really drives it home. He says, OK, one thing you still lack. Go and sell everything you have. Give it to the poor. And then he says, come follow me. Now, what is Jesus saying? Is he saying that if you want to become a Christian, you literally have to sell everything you own, give it away, and that's how you become a Christian? Is, is that a kind of universal command? Well, I don't think it is for two reasons. Firstly, because, you know, some people don't have much to give away. It wouldn't be hard. I mean, I work with students and everything they have is owned by the bank. So, I mean, this would be quite easy. They could give their debts away tomorrow. But also, in theory, of course, if this was true, if it was a universal command, there would be one person in the world who couldn't become a Christian because they would own everything that everyone else had given away. So Jesus isn't saying this is a universal command, but what he is saying to this man is this. What is the most important thing in your life? You see, Jesus, when he listed those commands earlier, he listed seven. But you might remember in the Old Testament, there were ten, not seven. He only listed the last seven. He didn't list the first three. Now, that's interesting because the last seven deal with how we relate to other people, but the first three deal with how we relate to God. And they basically say this, make sure that God is the most important thing in your life. And this response that this man makes to Jesus shows actually that the most important thing in his life, it's not God, it's his money. And he's not willing to give up his money to get what Jesus can offer. 
which is tragic, isn't it? Because he knows that it won't make him happy. He knows that life is not going to be satisfied no matter how much money he has, but he's still not willing to let go of it. It's a tragic story. But what's the point to us? Well, I think the point is this. Jesus saying, if you want to come to find the life as it was meant to be lived, if you want to come to discover the life that he wants to offer you, you won't find it by tacking a little bit of religion onto the edge of your life but it involves a radical reorientation of everything in your life. You see, sometimes we like to think of, you know, adding religion into our lives, a bit like adding air conditioning into your car. You know, it's kind of useful to have, you know, once or twice a year when the weather gets hot enough in Britain to actually need it, but it's not essential. But Jesus says, no, I'm not to be an add-on. I'm to be at the very heart. And tragically, this man is not willing to give up what he has to gain Jesus. I mentioned at the beginning, this is the story of the rich young ruler. He's often called that. But actually, you could say this is a story not just of a rich young ruler. You could say this is a story of rich young rulers, plural. You see, on the one hand, it's a story of a rich young man who won't give up everything he has to get Jesus. But actually, if you really know who Jesus was, you'd know actually that he was a rich young ruler. He was young, but the Bible says that he owned everything because he's God. He has all authority. He's the king. And yet while in this story, the first young, rich young ruler won't give up what he has to get Jesus, the story of the Bible is how Jesus, the rich young ruler, gives up everything he has for us. Didn't just give up his wealth. He gave up his life. He gave up everything for you and for me. And when you start to realise that the God who we discover in Jesus is a God who is so committed to you, who loves you so much that he was willing to give everything for you. You start to realise actually you might be wanting to give up everything to get him. See, here's the thing. Jesus once said it, in fact, just two chapters before the passage that we looked at tonight. He said, if you want to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you're willing to lose your life, you will find it. See, that's the paradox of the Christian faith. I was chatting to someone a while back and they said, you know, I'm intrigued by Christianity, but for me, it just feels like there's too much to give up. It feels like there's a big cost. And I said, yes, there is. Jesus says it will cost you everything. Like it literally does. And yet here's the, here's the paradox. You feel like you're giving up everything. But actually, Jesus says, but when you discover him, you get everything that you really need. You feel like you might be losing your life. And yet you're getting life as it was meant to be lived. Wasn't it great to hear Ewan's story? Ewan didn't strike you as a guy who had kind of given up everything and morosely was just kind of saying, woe is me. Here's a man who's discovered life. Yes, he had success. Yes, he had rugby. Yes, he had lots of great things. But in Jesus, he's discovered something even greater. And my question is, have you discovered the life that Jesus wants to give to you tonight? I don't know what you think about all of this. Maybe you think, well, I'm not even sure this is true. I just came to hear you and, and I've had this guy speaking at me pretending to be a Scottish fan. Well, if that's the case, can I just say before you write this off, before you reject it, at least check it out for yourself. I mean, have you ever taken the time as an adult to seriously think about the claims of Jesus? Have you ever taken the time to read one of those eyewitness historical accounts of his life? If not, why not? And why not do that now? Why not check it out? We'd love to send you a copy of one of them. Get in touch. We'll put the details up at the end and you can just get in touch with us and we'll send you part of the Bible that you can read for yourself. At least look into the evidence. Maybe you're saying, well, I'm kind of intrigued by this, but hey, this is a big deal. And it is. Jesus says it will cost you everything to follow him. So it's not something to take lightly. And maybe you need to think more about this. Maybe you've never thought about it before. Well, again, get in touch with us. We'd love to send you some stuff that would help you to investigate these claims further. Um, not just a part of the Bible, but some books that look into these things further. Do do that. And if you'd like to chat with any of us, then get in contact as well. We'd love to get in contact with you. But maybe tonight you'd say, actually, I, I think this might be true. Maybe you've thought about this before, but actually you've never, like you, and come to that point of actually entrusting your life to Jesus Christ. 
But maybe tonight is the night for you to do that. Maybe tonight is the night for you to say, yes, I want to receive what Jesus Christ has given to me and I want to give my life to following him. In one sense, it's a huge thing to do. But actually, if this is true, and actually there's loads of reasons to believe that it is, it is the most sensible and it is the best decision you'll ever make. So I want to finish with a short prayer, a prayer that you might just want to echo wherever you are watching tonight or maybe in the weeks and months to come. A prayer that you could echo to God as a way of responding to what we've heard tonight. And I just ask you, why don't you pray with me as I pray now? Let me pray. Dear God, I'm sorry for the way that I've kept you out of my life and lived for other things and not you. I recognise that these will never satisfy and I recognise that I was made to know you. God, thank you that in Jesus you love me and gave yourself for me so that all of my wrong and sin could be taken away and I could be forgiven and know you. Please, God, will you come into my life? Give me this eternal life, this relationship that you promise and help me to live from this moment onwards with you at the centre of my life and my heart. For I pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. I'm going to hand back to Roger uh, before we go to the questions. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. That's uh, super. Now, um, we do have the opportunity to ask questions to Michael and to Ewan. I'm not sure that Ewan's connected with us yet, but we're trying to get that. So... Um, um, anyway, let's let's see on that. Let me just remind you the way to ask questions is uh, if we can go back on the screen for this, please go on to Slido, www.slido.com, code 8158 or by text 07931 715. 075. So if you have any questions, and of course for Michael, we better say that because we, we might need you more than you and Michael. Uh, but it's a tremendous claim. If, if Jesus Christ really is God, who's come into this world to die for us, to pay for our sin and to rise from the dead so that we could be forgiven and find in him all in all. That is an incredible claim. So um, hey, I, I, it's not for me to speak, but to ask Michael any questions and Ewan, but we hope to have him very shortly. So um, I'm going to hand over to Phyllis. Um, maybe you could begin if we've got questions for Michael, have we? Yes, we have. Yes. Great. Oh, great. I'm glad that you have questions for me because otherwise I was going to have to pretend to be Ewan before Ewan comes. I'm not <laughs> sure. Despite the fact I'm wearing a Scotland rugby shirt, I do that very well. So oh, Ewan, oh, Ewan's here as well. Yeah. I can see him. Welcome. Fantastic. I don't have to pretend to be Ewan. Welcome, Ewan. We've enjoyed the interview. Thank you very much. So it's now question time to, um, to Michael and Ewan, but Phyllis is going to chair those. Just be, yeah, we, um, we've got you on mute. There we are. You're on mute. Okay. Hi there. Can you hear me? Okay? Yeah, that's yeah, fine. Great. In fact, I'll give Michael a bit of a break. You and I'm going to start. There's quite a lot of questions that have come in for you. And okay. um, did you find that other players were watching you to see if this change in you was genuine after <laughs> you were converted? Uh, yeah, probably. Um, I think, you know, at the start, I would think uh, some guys might have thought it was just a phase I was going through. But, um, you know, that was the start. And then as things went on, uh, yeah, there was the normal uh, banter in the in the changing rooms, you know, if I said something or, um, you know, made a joke, uh, then guys would say, oh, that's not very Christian. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but, you know, usually it was benign and uh, they were just having fun. They respected you, hopefully. And um, another question here. What advice would you give a 10-year-old watching who loves his rugby but also loves Jesus? How can one impact the other in a positive way? Um, well, I think that the, you know, the, the policy that Christians in sport has um, is really good, which is pray, play, say. Um, so you know, obviously praying for your teammates, uh, playing as hard as you can and enjoying it. That's, uh, that's the most important thing with rugby is to enjoy it. 
Um, and then when you get opportunities to talk to people about Jesus. Um, so, yeah, just go and enjoy it and have fun and try to try to be different with with the Lord's help. Thank you. There's a bit of background here. So someone obviously knows a little bit here. Um, do you regret not playing on Sunday in the World Cup in New Zealand when the Lions lost by just one point? Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't have any regrets about not playing on a Sunday. Um, How did your team react? I think... Some guys respected it. I think th some guys found it hard and it may have irritated other guys. Um, but, you know, I was, it was my conscience that bothered me uh, when I did play on Sundays. And then so when I came to the decision to not play on a Sunday, um, I felt that I had to, I, I had to listen to my conscience. Um, I don't have any regrets um, in making that decision. Um, you know, the the day of rest was made for man, uh, mankind, to enjoy. It was a blessing, um, and it is a blessing. Mm. Yeah, to to rest and um, to to remember that. God has made all things and and he's offered us eternal life in Christ Jesus. And so we can rest in Jesus, in his work for us. And that's why it's, it's good to concentrate on that on a Sunday. I, you know, I'm, I work as a vet now, so uh, sometimes I have to work on Sundays. And I think that's, I think that's fine because... You know, if your donkey is stuck in a ditch, um, then you have to go and pull it out. So, you know, Jesus showed uh, he he ripped off all the all the rubbish from what the Pharisees had added to the the day, and they had kind of blocked it off and wasted it. Um, and so he he showed that you could do acts of mercy and uh, necessity on the day of rest and um and i enjoy it <laughs> i still enjoy it so in answer to the question i don't have regrets um yeah okay um have you thoughts about the possible link with rugby and dementia and head injuries what are your thoughts there well somebody asked me about that today and um behind my mask. <laughs> I was like, no, I haven't had any effects. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, man, I had a, I had a quite a few concussions um, and it did worry me after I finished rugby and I had to start, uh, man, I got all my notes out and started uh, studying for the North American Vet License Exam. Um, and I was worried uh, because, you know, I do have uh, sometimes I just get, I can't remember that guy's name, uh, you know, and I think that happened to me probably, you know, when I was younger as well. So maybe it's, maybe I'm getting more senior moments. I don't know. There, there is, I mean, I think the, the evidence would suggest that head knocks, mm. um, repeated head knocks and concussions uh, have a detrimental effect on the brain. And mm -hmm. if that speeds up degenerative processes, then, um, then unfortunately that, you know, that's, it's part of these contact sports, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's terrible. I, I feel, uh, I really feel for these guys who are suffering um i i don't know if there's an easy fix i think you know we all knew the risks of you know playing rugby and yeah bash about um but i'd rather yeah yeah i don't want to say too much 
Fine. And um, did you come across any other committed Christians in rugby or even in your veterinary world at the moment? Yes, but I can't remember their names. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a name here. Did you ever meet Israel Falau? Um, I didn't ever meet Israel, no. I don't think so. Um, I know I know of him, um, but yeah, I don't, uh, I, I didn't meet him. Uh, but Andrew Trimble, um, he was a, he was a good encouragement uh, when I played, um, amongst other guys. And did you get involved in um, Christians in sport? I did. Uh, they were very supportive. Um, Pete Nicholas, he he was involved um, in supporting me, and uh, he was he was uh, he was really encouraging. Um, and you know he. He's still, I think he's still involved. He's a, he's a pastor in a church in London. Um, so if any any people are in London, uh, look out for Pete Nicholas. <laughs> Find his church. One of the things you mentioned, your father didn't go to church with you when you were children. Your mother took you to church. Were there any changes in your father? Um, I don't know. He's still alive now, but did he change? Um. No, not yet. So my, yeah, my father is, he, he has, um, he has signs of dementia now. So it's, it was always difficult to speak to him about, um, you know, eternal issues. Yeah. About God, uh, you know, about, about Christ. Um, but I pray on for him. And, you know, I think even if his mind isn't what it was and is starting to go, I believe that God can work on the heart and soul. Um, and all it takes is for uh, the Lord to shine the light of his gospel into somebody's heart. Um, so the power is in, the power is with God. Um and, and I know that God loves my father more than I do. Mm. Um, and, and everyone else, you know, all my other friends who, who don't yet believe. And it's, they, they have a responsibility to, to turn to the Lord um, and to believe in him um, mm. and to accept his, all he offers um but it's god who who opens the he's the one that opens the heart and um yeah yeah so we pray on yeah pray on and um, michael maybe I'll, I'll give you a couple of questions um you seem very positive but it seems to me that religion is just negative and against everything um, well, I'm glad that you think I'm quite positive. That's that's quite nice. Um, uh, but but yes, um, I guess what I want to say is we're not trying to advocate religion in one sense. Uh, that's not what we're about because actually sometimes religion can be quite negative. Often religion is about you know don't do this and don't do that. Um, and and actually it's very interesting if you read through as we suggest you do one of the accounts of Jesus' life, you'll see the people that Jesus often has the strongest words of condemnation to are not the irreligious but the religious. And actually he says very often that the religious are taking away people's life. But he says I've come to give you life and to give it in all its fullness. Um, and actually, as we've seen tonight, um, Jesus turns religion on its head. We think, you know, if I'm going to get to God, it's all about what I do. And that, just like that man, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, you don't have to do anything. I've done it for you. You don't have to do it. I've given my life. I've made it possible for you to be forgiven. I've made it possible for you to be connected to God. And now I want you to enjoy the relationship that I have made available because of my death on the cross. So I'd say, yes, religion can be quite negative. We're not offering you religion. We want to offer you Jesus. It's a very oh. different story. Yeah, good re and a relationship. Do you think that God is judging us as a nation with COVID as we're not giving him first place, bearing in mind what you said about this man, not putting Jesus first? That's a very interesting question. And I've, and over the last year people have asked that question is this a is this a deliberate judgment of god or not and in a sense i have to say 
I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm not God. Um, and I have no special word from God. And I'm not aware that we have been given one. But it is interesting that, in a sense, a judgment from God is almost like a crisis that can cause us to ask questions. So whether or not this is a deliberate judgment from God in the way that, say, there were judgments in the Old Testament in the story of Exodus and so on, I do believe that God is revealing the foundations, or rather the lack of foundations that many of us have, particularly in the West. And in the sense, while we see judgments as a negative thing, actually in a sense in the Bible, there is a gracious element, a kind element to judgments. See, God is actually sometimes stripping away and showing us the foundation of our lives or the lack of a foundation before it's too late. And that's actually a really gracious thing. Wouldn't it be tragic to live our whole lives and to build them on the wrong foundation? Mm. And maybe it takes something like this, particularly in the West where we're very comfortable and we think, you know, as long as I've got my job, my house and everything sorted out, everything's fine. Maybe it takes something like this to actually get us to question and ask these big questions. And, and I would say, therefore, don't miss the opportunity. So I said at the beginning, sometimes it's everything going right. And sometimes it's everything going wrong that can cause us to ask questions. But, but whether everything's going right in your life, whether it's going wrong, the question is, are we going to, to turn to the God who gave us life and can be the foundation which will never be taken away? Thank you. You and just one further question, if he's, if he's still with us. Yes. yes. Um, it's where did you meet your wife? And when it says here, has she always been a Christian? Obviously, she hasn't. She's made a profession herself. When did she become a Christian? Yeah. <laughs> when did when where did we meet where and when did she? Wife? Yes. When okay, did you meet? Uh, uh, I met her in 2010. Uh, she was over in the UK studying. Um, She's American, uh, so she was over studying, and then and then we met. We met in Glasgow, um, one fateful Sunday. And um, <laughs> yeah, when did she become a Christian? Um, was that in England? Different? No, I think you know several years before she had been brought up in a Christian home, um, and she backslid, and then. Um, she came back to the Lord uh, in her uh, early 20s and he restored her. So, and then, and then he brought us together and we got married. Lovely. Thank <laughs> you so much, Ewan. Lovely to meet you. And yeah, I'm going to come back to you now. Thanks. Yes, Ewan, we're really grateful to you. Thank you so much. Um, Thanks, Roger. I think you're doing something which we've forgotten all about. I think actually you've got guests around in your house. Do you remember that in the oh. UK? We used to be able to do that, didn't we? But anyway, <laughs> uh, as a little thank you, we're going to send you a bundle of books for your five children. Oh. So oh, thanks. thank you very much. Uh, the ten of those who send it, of course. And Michael, <laughs> yeah, it's just good to have you. <laughs> thank you very much. Let me just uh, remind you about next week then. Um, Gus Air, we're going to have a song from him in a moment, is going to be singing and uh, he'll be interviewed. Uh, I think it's a different and a relaxing, a lovely evening with Gus next week at eight o'clock. Please do tell your friends about um, about Real Lives. We, we want as many people as possible to know. As Michael mentioned, though, if you get in touch with us, we'd love to, well, we'd love to hear from you anyway, but if you get in touch with us at www.reallives.net, there is a little form you can fill in and we would send you gladly a, a, a lovely new testament or a booklet explaining how to become a christian or if you have any questions or you want help in any way do get in touch please just write to us don't forget that um, you can now get real lives with british sign language so if you know anybody who uses it or who's deaf it'd be good to introduce them to real lives and uh, you need to get on to 10 of those tonight if you want those two books by um, michael half price it means he won't get such great royalties but anyway um what kind of god and what kind of hope half price tonight on the 10 of those or if you want you and story everyone a winner as well it's really good to have had you we appreciate you sparing the evening and look forward to seeing you god willing next saturday bye Love the Lord with all of your heart, with all your soul, not just a part. To love the Lord with everything within you. 
Love your neighbor as yourself Share with him eternal wealth Pointing to the one who gives you life Welcome children in my name Touch the lonely and help the lame in everything You must be my servant the widow and fatherless show my love with all that is within you bless all those who curse your name turn your cheek and take the blame pointing to the one who gives you life bear good fruit in all that you do have a humble attitude in everything you must be servant in everything you must be my servant so love the Lord with all of your heart with all your soul not just a part love the Lord everything within you and love your neighbor as yourself share with him eternal wealth pointing to the one who gives you life welcome children in my name touch the lonely and help the lame in everything you must be my servant in everything you must be my servant in everything you must be my servant